my prime focus will be on the cosmological constant. And this is going to happen tomorrow. So those of you who are not here today should make sure they come tomorrow. Okay. So I will actually propose a solution to the cosmological constant problem and how it provides a new perspective on cosmology. So in some sense, everything which I am going to say today, especially the slightly esoteric parts which you don't see in textbooks, are all geared and rammed up for tomorrow's talk, which is the main thing. So today I will, I have been asked by the uh, organizers to give a gentle introduction. I will try that. The best I can do is to make sure that everybody is uniformly unhappy. <laughs> and I will talk about the standard description. And geared towards this, I will say something about what I call the epoch invariant description of cosmology. And I will allude a little bit about cosmic constants other than lambda. And, uh, but this cosmological constant will be sort of omnipresent throughout the lecture. So let us begin with the standard way in which we look at the universe. So the background universe, where you ignore all the perturbations, is described by a set of densities. We believe that something like inflation took place in the early universe and characterized by some energy density scale. There is radiation in current universe. There is dark matter and baryons in the current universe. And there is dark energy which for the purpose of this talk is essentially provided by the cosmological constant. So in addition to this, the structure formation introduces, potentially it introduces many constants, but you can do a simple parameterization of an initial power spectrum, which has an amplitude and an index. So these are the numbers which describe the smooth universe plus the structures which we see in them. Now, on top of it, of course, we want to add the geometrical description. So this is the standard Friedman Robertson Walker matrix for a spatially flat universe. I will very briefly make a comment on why I'm going to concentrate only on the spatially flat universe later on, but that is what I'm going to do. If there is some density and pressure in the universe, then it satisfies this equation and given your equation of state, you can translate that into how the density is evolving with the uh, expansion factor. The Einstein's equation for this metric reduces to two equations, which are given here. And of course, as we all know, out of these three, only two are independent, and you can derive the other from that. So this is the description which we have. The first thing you need to understand about cosmology is that everything is possible in the following sense. Suppose you want the universe to evolve in a particular way, you give me this AFT and I will make a universe for you which has with a suitable equation of state P of rho such that this is the solution to the Einstein's equation. What do I do? I take A of T from which I calculate A dot upon A which is the Hubble parameter and you calculate H square which is a function of T and I define my density by this relation. I define my pressure by this relation. So given two functions of time, I can eliminate T between these two and I write down an equation of state. Then you can go and write a paper saying that you have solved Einstein's equation for this very strange equation of state and it gives you A of T evolving in a very strange way which you like. Believe it or not, I do get such papers for refereeing. So unless you give me some rules of the game, as to what kind of rho and what kind of p are allowed, cosmology is an underdetermined science. You can do anything you want and you can have any expansion factor you want. Usually in the good old days, people used to believe density and pressure should be positive. And then density is positive here. Well, over the time we have grown up and learned to live with negative pressures. We are still keeping these two real, but that is just about it. Okay, so as a result of which virtually any kind of universe is uh, fair game in today's cosmology. This is why you either need observations which tells you what kind of rho and p exist in the universe or you need some kind of a theoretical principle to select them. The observations around the current epoch look something like this. These are the supernova data. 
this is not the way you would have normally seen it, but uh, I believe this is a nice way to present that. So, this is the phase space of the universe, this is the velocity of the universe a dot plotted against the coordinate of the universe a and the equation governing it just to remind you is this which tells you that a double dot is negative if rho and p are positive. Now, you can obviously see that a double dot is not negative, it is increasing here. So, clearly rho and p cannot both be positive and if you do a best fit and you want to introduce some kind of a negative pressure, the simplest choice is a cosmological constant. So, these are the equations you will have and lambda is the cosmological constant which has dimensions of inverse length square which is of the order of 10 to the minus 56 and this gives you a nice fit to this accelerating universe. The universe is accelerating here, it was decelerating at this phase and cosmological constants started dominating the universe somewhere around here. This is the kind of picture which we have, but this supernova data is not the first time we have seen cosmological constants in action and uh, for those of you the younger members of the audience who might not have lived through these days, let me just run you through. The first time I was alerted and I took very seriously the existence of cosmological constant is a piece of work done here, George F. Tastio and his collaborators. This is from the APM survey and they very strongly argued that this data requires a cosmological constant and of course, they were completely ignored except by a few guys like me. Then when the COBE results came out in 1992, many of us including my group wrote a paper saying that if you take the COBE normalization and you combine it with all other data which was available at that time, it does not fit the standard CDM model and you need a smoothly distributed material in the universe which could be the cosmological constant. At that time things started being taken a bit more seriously, but uh, nobody really liked the cosmological constant. A few years later, two groups one in which I was involved in and the other from Jerry and Paul wrote these two papers and these two graphs are from those papers. The key difference is that we plotted h versus omega m, they plotted omega m versus h. Okay? And by and large we both concluded that there is a cosmological constant based on all the observational data. So, all this was before the uh, supernova data came along and it introduced the cosmological constant. So, given the fact that we now believe there is a cosmological constant possibly in the universe, how do I introduce that? I would like to bring that in in a particular way by pointing out that gravity actually breaks a symmetry which exists in the absence of gravity. If you write down the action in special relativity let us say for a set of matter fields with a Lagrangian and you integrate over a 4 volume, this Lagrangian has a very trivial symmetry that you can add or subtract a constant to it. Nobody really thinks of it as a symmetry, but it is a symmetry in the sense that this transformation does not change the equations of motion. The equation of the motion which comes from a Lagrangian only cares about the derivatives, so this does not matter. So, you can add a constant to it, that is a symmetry. That continues to be a symmetry even in a given curved geometry, start uh, pre-decided curved geometry. So, you just put a root minus g here and you change ordinary derivatives to covariant derivatives and you can add a constant even here. The equations of motion for the matter sector still obeys this symmetry that I can add a constant to it, but things change once you bring gravity in. You say that gravity is no longer a background, but it is dynamical and you add a gravitational sector Lagrangian to it. Then you find that this root minus g has now been rise to a dynamical field and that couples to these fields and now if I add a constant that constant goes and couples to root minus g. So, the equations of motion are no longer invariant under an addition of a constant to the let us say standard model Lagrangian. What is the zero level of the Lagrangian changes the equations of motion. Because of this, it is quite obvious that it does not matter whether I add that constant to the matter sector, I add that constant to the gravity sector. Nature only cares for the total sum. In fact, you can add rho 1 to one of them and rho 2 to the other one and agonize over what is rho 1 and what is rho 2 and what is its difference, but mathematics does not care for that. 
So, you can dump all of them here and usually it is written as 2 lambda with this taken out and that is what you call the cosmological constant. So, obviously, it picks up all the constants you can add here. So, for the purpose of my talk, I am just going to think of the cosmological constant having been added to the constant in LM. Okay. So, if there is a constant there, that fixes for me the zero of the level and that is what my cosmological constant is. So, in fact, it looks very nice in the context of just Friedman universe, where you can reduce this action functional to a very simple form, which involves only the dynamical degree of freedom. And in this way, you will find that if I add a constant to this, it actually does go and uh, couple to this uh, uh, gravity. So, why am I saying that it is all going to be cosmological constant? What about quintessence? What about quintessence and scalar fields and all that? I am not going to talk about it at all for several reasons and this is just a brief slide to list them. First, I think somebody already mentioned it yesterday, I believe uh, John Barrow. There were three Johns talking yesterday, so I had to specify which John it was. And John Barrow, I think said that uh, it really does not solve the cosmological constant problem. It was known even much before this and it will continue to exist. Second, as I told you, given any AFT, you can always cook up a universe model. And if you have a scalar field, you are definitely in business. If you give me some kind of a expansion history and some kind of a known matter energy densities, I can make these two consistent by always choosing a scalar potential V of phi. This is a theorem. You can actually explicitly write down the form of V of phi to do this. It was done by this group as well as by me in, with some slight modifications and that will produce. So, the scalar field models are completely non-predictive. And finally, as I will glance through uh, soon, it is not needed by observation. We do not see a running in the dark energy density. So, as a result of which it is not really needed. So, we are not going to talk about uh, anything other than the cosmological constant as dark energy. Now, having done this much, let us go a little bit more into the dynamics of the universe. The first point is that the universe comes with the two very natural length scales. The first one is the proper Hubble radius, which is the inverse of the uh, Hubble time H of t. And if you look at the co-moving Hubble radius, you just remove this a and it is 1 by a dot. You can also take any length scale and ask how it stretches as the universe expands. It stretches in proportion to a. So, you can introduce a wave number which is inverse length and write it as a of t upon k. So, if you have a fixed co-moving wave number, then the length scales, proper length scales grow as a of t. So, given these two length scales, there is a natural epoch in the universe, usually more than one, at which a length scale will cross the Hubble radius. So, this is the time when lambda of t is equal to h inverse of t which is the same as saying that the co-moving k is equal to a dot or it is equal to a h. So, given any expansion history and a given co-moving scale k, I can solve for this and find out when it crosses it. So, how does it look like in our standard scenario? I have told you this is the phase space of the universe and you can associate with each one of them an inverse length scale in mega parsec inverse. We are more comfortable with length scale rather than inverse length scale, so we can invert that. So, this tells you the co-moving length scales as it changes, but we would prefer to think in terms of proper length scale. So, this is what that picture is. So, this is the way the proper length scales in the universe evolves corresponding to this a dot upon a and this is in uh, nice mega per second. This is the way the Hubble radius of the universe is changing and we know from observations this is how it goes, which is good. But now if you take a broader view of the things, the entire supernova observation is sitting right here. So, the universe is evolving from a radiation dominated epoch to a matter dominated epoch and then slowly going over to a cosmological constant dominated epoch where the Hubble radius remains constant. So, the Hubble radius is evolving here and then it is flattening out here. Now, if I take any other length scale, for example, if you take a 
physically relevant length scale like, uh, for example, the baryon acoustic oscillation scale or the Hubble radius at the time of matter radiation equality, then these length scales go just linearly with A. So, they were bigger than the Hubble radius earlier on. They enter the Hubble radius, they are sub Hubble radius here and they will exit the Hubble radius at some time in the future. So, remember that the percent is somewhere here. Okay. Now, there are theoretical reasons why this is not a very good thing that if various wavelength scales are bigger than the Hubble radius early on, then generating density perturbations by causal processes poses a bit of a problem. This is solved by inflation. What inflation tells you is that there is this cosmological constant dominated phase, here are supernova observations and here is the matter dominated phase and the radiation dominated phase. But somewhere deep down you say that there was also another phase which was like almost like a cosmological constant phase with the uh, Hubble radius almost remaining constant. If that is the case, you can have a length scale which is sub Hubble radius here and some causal process can operate here and produce for example, your density perturbations. They leave the Hubble radius and then they re-enter again sometime during matter or radiation dominated phase depending on what length scale you choose and then it can go out. So, the inflation gives you a picture like this. Keep that in mind. This is going to be very useful tomorrow. <laughs> now, if you want to describe the universe in more detail, then I had already told you that this is the parameterization which mathematics tells you. But observers like to do this slightly differently. So, they will write down the equation for a dot square upon a square in terms of the value of the Hubble constant today, then the density parameters for radiation and matter because k is equal to 0, the remaining thing gives you the dark energy density parameter that this so this term will be the dark energy. Then there is the radiation which falls as 1 over a to the power 4 and matter which falls are 1 over a cubed. At very early on during inflation, this equation will be replaced by the h square at inflation. So, if you look at it this way, you are parameterizing the evolution of the universe in terms of the Hubble constant during inflation, current value of the Hubble constant, <coughs> the omega for radiation, matter and the n0. Usually you set n0 equals 1, it is a little non-trivial compared to what usually textbooks claim to be. So, if I have time, I will come back to it later. But let us set it to 1 for the moment, in which case these are the remaining parameters. Now, what does observations tell you about these parameters? So, here are a few observations. It is mandatory that in a cosmology talk, these pictures are shown. It is not that it is going to tell you anything more than what you already know. So, I am just following the rule. So, here is, so this is from the view of particle properties and uh, this is omega lambda versus omega m and there is a whole lot of observations which sort of narrows it down to something like 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. So, here is another one where the w is the p by rho of the equation of state for the universe, the dark energy sector of the universe and minus 1 is the preferred value for the cosmological constant and you find that observations are consistent with that and of course, it depends on what omega m you give. So, this is the Hubble constant. There is some amount of tension between that and the Planck results, but these things uh, keep coming and going in cosmology. So, this tells you uh, in a parametric way whether the cosmological constant or not cosmological constant, the dark energy in the universe is evolving. So, the value minus 1 is the preferred value. And if it is not evolving, this sort of refers to how it is changing with respect to the expansion factor, the first derivative and that is 0. So, this would be cosmological constant and the data is consistent with the non-evolving cosmological constant being the dark energy. Then you go ahead and look at the parameters which describe the structure formation. For example, the amplitude of the perturbations which is related to what is known as sigma 8 and uh, omega matter and you again find that observations are fairly consistent with uh, what you think of. So, this is a picture with John Ellis uh, flash today morning. This is from the Planck data and this is interesting. What it tells you is a ratio here of tensor to scalar. The inflation 
The vacuum fluctuations during the inflation produces scalar density perturbation, which we believe uh, sort of nucleates the structures which we see today. But in addition, it also generates spin to graviton modes. And there is a ratio which you can measure between how much of these spin 2 modes will be there relative to this color. And you can plot it against the index of the primordial power spectrum, a k to the n where it is n. Now, what you find from Planck is that if you over plot various uh, models of inflation, there are certain models, this is the sort of contour which you draw and they came up with an upper limit of something like 0.15. So, what has happened yesterday, though I said I am not going to talk about it, I will just make a comment. What has happened yesterday is that this value has been pushed up, it is more like 0.2 out here. And if you see the picture with John Ellis flash, you will, and if you read the small print in that picture in the paper which is up in the web, you will see that that picture was generated by assuming that this uh, Primo, this index of perturbation itself is running. So, the Planck gave two results and uh, they said that the running of this is consistent with 0, which means it does not run. And if you assume it does not run and you do your statistics, this is what you get. But they also have another result that if it does run, how much it is and then it goes up a bit further. And if you assume that the index does run, and then you can sort of draw a contour like this and you can put the biceps curve somewhere out here. Okay. So, what the message I want you to take back from this is that all this is still in a state of flux, but there is some kind of an idea that the tensor to scalar ratio is probably not 0.3. Okay. So, it is there is a bound which you can put on that and using that you can in principle rule out or prefer models of inflation. Okay, I will not comment on that, this is just a comment that k is equal to 0 is also coming from Planck. So, the picture out of all these would be that cosmology is a solved problem. Okay, so, we know all the parameters in the universe and we just have to go and uh, calculate uh, more numbers. So, this is the kind of pic, uh, numbers which you will have. And there are lots of people out there who want to increase the precision on each one of the, these numbers. I wish them luck and that is a worthwhile pursuit and we will get better and better accuracy on these numbers. But for the rest of the talk today and tomorrow, I would like to look at this a bit more closer. The first thing we notice is that we have absolutely no clue about what makes up 70 percent of our universe. Well, then there is dark matter. We have various choices, but we have not seen this particle in the lab. Then there is this baryon, you would have thought that that would be the easiest thing, but we do not have a unique model which will predict this value. I mean there are various possibilities by which you can get this number, but no unique model. The only good news is that we understand this, okay. radiation is fine. And then you have the structure formation scenario in which you need two numbers, the amplitude of the perturbations and the index. And the best bet we have is from inflation, but you want to know which model you want to choose and this is the post Planck list. Okay? So, anything which is manifestly ruled out by Planck is not in this list and this list is still incomplete because Martin had his own preferences for certain ideas. So, I can add to this. So, you can take any one of them. There is also another issue about inflation which I want to draw your attention to. Some of you might be aware that after Planck there was a bit of a controversy which was created by this gentleman who wrote up a paper saying that the Planck results which Planck team sort of claims is consistent with inflation actually says that it has created a lot of problems for the inflationary model. So, Andrew and Alan came up with a rejoinder to that paper. And then these guys put up this second paper, which I would really suggest that you go and read. It is not that I believe everything which these guys say, but when I talk to people who are not cosmologists and sometimes even to some cosmologists, they have the impression that cosmic inflation is something like nucleosynthesis or recombination. It is not. It is not at that level of definiteness, but that is the way most of the time inflation advocates will talk about. So, reading 
a paper like this will tell you what are the issues involved, even if you don't want to take a stand on that. So what these guys essentially said that the original classic inflationary paradigm had some very nice ideas. And there were some conceptual problems which were known before Planck, but after Planck, many of these issues have become much worse. So the reply which uh, Andrew Linde and Alan Good provided, these people criticized again in this paper by pointing out that they are actually advocating a postmodern inflationary paradigm and that itself has some problems. So as I said, uh, I don't completely agree with this paper, but I thought I should put this up because usually you hear so much about inflation, but you don't hear so much about the comments or criticism of the inflation and it is worth reading, at least the younger people in the audience should do that. I would like to point out one mathematical fact about inflation, which is not conceptual or anything, which again has not been um, stressed adequately. It is certainly true that today the best bet which we have for producing an initial perturbation with a k to the n with n approximately equal to 1 is inflation. I don't know of any other model which does even halfway as good as inflation does. However, when you look at the way it is generated, it is rather interesting. The mechanism goes like this. You first start with, it is quantum fluctuations which are going to be transformed into classical fluctuation. So you want to, you have to first tell me what is the initial quantum state of the scalar field. And that is usually postulated to be something called a Bunch Davis vacuum state. And given that Bunge Davis vacuum state, you can convert the vacuum fluctuations into some initial density perturbation. This is again not as clear as it would be conceptually because there are issues about starting with something purely quantum mechanical and getting something classical. But let us assume that you can do that. Then you take a favorite cosmological model and you evolve it and you find what is the perturbations at 10 to the 3 and that is what you compare with CMB. Okay. So this is a very well defined route, you start from here, you do this and you, there are some conceptual issues here but if you forget that you get this and this is perfectly well defined, this is just mathematics, is partial differential equations. So integrate it and you get this. But suppose you want to do it in a slightly different way. Somebody tells you what is the perturbations at the time of recombination and suppose they tell you it is Gaussian etc. You choose a cosmological model which you like and you run it backwards, you do this backwards and that process is very well defined and you will end up getting an initial density perturbation. You can for example choose the open model with omega is equal to 0.3 and you can evolve it back and you will get this. This will be a very strange beast, it will have all kinds of scales built into it because in order to produce the observations here which has this beautiful characteristic peaks etc., you have to code all these things in. And then you ask, could this have been generated by some kind of a vacuum fluctuations? Well, the interesting answer is yes. It turns out that for most, I mean all for practical purposes, delta in which I give you, I can choose a quantum state for this color field such that this can be produced. Now, both this state as well as this will be very unnatural. It will have fine-tuned scales and features, etc. But it is not impossible. So when you say that uh, you do generate inflationary perturbations by this process, remember that there are certain assumptions which go into the quantum, initial quantum state and how the vacuum fluctuations generate this. And that is how you end up getting this. And uh, in fact, the seldovich harrison spectrum which predicted this was suggested decades before inflation. So there are independent ways of looking at how this initial spectrum could be generated. Except that Coming back to this statement, no one has been able to come up with a halfway decent model which is a good alternative to inflation, so I still believe this is probably the best bet. But these caveats should be kept in mind. Okay, so if you sum up this whole thing, I would essentially say that we do know a lot about the universe today, but we understand extremely little. Okay, so there are all these parameters which uh, whose meaning sort of defies us. So how can we make more sense out of cosmic dynamics? So here is where the title of the talk, The Constants of the Cosmos comes in. 
Normally, as I said, the observers would like to use these as the constants, but these are really not cosmic constants. Okay, these are very much related to the fact that the observers are sitting here today and they are making these observations. But the cosmic constant, the true cosmic constant should have a meaning which is completely independent of the epoch at which you send your uh, Hubble Space Telescope or Planck satellite up there. Okay. So, if you, if you go to cosmologists at redshift of 8, at redshift of 8 we do see galaxies and there could be planetary systems and there could be cosmologists with their own uh, funding schemes and satellites. What they would measure is that at that epoch, they would have measured the CMB temperature to be about 24 Kelvin. They will find that the universe is still decelerating, but if they are very clever they would have figured out that there is a cosmological constant there, so it can accelerate into the future. And they would write down the corresponding equation like this, where this, 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 all these quantities will be different for them. So, they will parameterize the universe in terms of the values which they observe and uh, they would have probably said even this A star equals 1 just as we set A naught equals 1 today. This will work of course, because there is a translation table between that and this, but this is not the most natural way to describe the universe. There is a much better way. The way you do this is to introduce parameters into the Friedman equation, which has a meaning which is completely independent of the epoch at which you are measuring them, whether it is cosmologists at the redshift of 8 or today. And that can be done very easily. First, you have the density scale at inflation. There is some kind of an effective density scale because I had already told you my own uh, discomfort about the about accepting inflation in total. But assuming that the Hubble radius sort of turned around at very early epoch, it means that there is some kind of an effective inflationary density scale, which is there, and that is a pure number whether I measure it or whether a cosmologist at redshift of 8 measures it, it will have the same value. Then if cosmological constant is what constitutes the dark energy, they will have another density with us. After that, you can introduce another constant in the universe. What you do is to take the matter density to the fourth power and divide it by radiation density to the factor 3 and using this remarkable fact that 4 into 3 is 3 into 4 and something goes as 1 over a 4 and one something goes as 1 over a cubed, you immediately know that this number is a constant, it is independent of a. Okay. So, it does not matter who computes it, the redshift is that cosmologists can take this thing and will get a number and I can compute it today and I will get a number. And this is essentially the density of either radiation or matter at the time when both of them are equal, because at that time 3 and 4 will give you this rho eq. This is the rho at the equality epoch of the radiation and uh, matter. And we know that there is the Stephen Boltzmann's law, which tells you that there is a T eq, which is the temperature of the radiation at the moment of this radiation uh, matter equality. And this is also a fixed number for the universe, whether I do it or somebody else at a redshift of 8 do is, they will arrive at the same number. So, you have rho inflation, rho lambda and rho eq, which are three constant, three universal constants, no pun intended, which with which you can characterize the cosmos. <coughs> you also can define a a eq, which is you take the radiation, multiply it by a at the epoch and then divide by matter. And this is essentially the value of the expansion factor at the time of radiation matter equality and that is also a pure number, but I will come back to it later that is clearly related to E naught. So, the Friedman equation will look like this in terms of uh, rho lambda and rho eq. So, I am assuming that we are in the post inflationary phase, you just have to add a rho inflation to the uh, list of constants if you want to describe inflation. So, in the post inflationary evolution of the universe which is well determined to some extent by observations is decided by just two densities rho lambda and rho eq. And if you scale out a eq or you set it to 1, then this is the equation which you need to solve. So, this is a completely epoch invariant description of the universe. So, now we can ask what does observations tell us about this. Okay. First, if you take the Planck result, 
it essentially tells you that rho inflation is less than something like uh, 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV to the power 4. Okay. Now, again, this is not as sacred as sometimes theoreticians uh, take it to be because I told you one slide full of inflationary models. There is a subset of inflationary models in which you can convert the uh, tensor to scalar ratio bound to this energy scale of inflation. But it is also possible to write down inflationary models where this relation is uh, sort of violated. So, the translation from what you observe to this is not as precise as you would like to, but it is the most natural kind of uh, number which you can come up with. Second, you can calculate what is rho eq. This is more well defined and we know what its value is and we know what is rho lambda. So, that has this value. So, these are the three numbers by which we are characterizing our universe. Now, at this stage, since the post inflationary evolution, which is observationally well determined, is decided by just two densities, rho lambda and rho eq, it is a good thing to pass and look at these two numbers. Now, you know that cosmological constant has a very bad press because of the value, this was already alluded to yesterday that uh, the cosmological constant times g h cross upon c cubed which is the Planck length square L p square and this lambda is the has inverse centimeter square and this is centimeter square this is a dimensionless number. So, you can also write it in terms of the energy density in the cosmological constant multiplied by L p to the power 4 in the units when h cross and c are 1 which are the natural units where the densities go as 1 upon length to the power 4. And if you do either of them you get a number like this. Okay. So, I am sure all of you have heard this and uh, some of you might have even worried about it. But look at rho eq, it has this value. Okay. Now, in fact, uh, it came as a great surprise to some leading cosmologists. So, in fact, I would like to know how many of you have seen this number before? Just put up your hand. Okay, fine. There are a few people, but not many. That is what I thought. The point is, of course, once I give you the number and since you know this, you can do it in your head and you can realize this is. So, if rho lambda L p to the power 4 10 to the minus 122 is a fine tuning, what about rho eq L p to the power 4 which is 10 to the minus 113? Do we want to take the stand that 113 is ok, but 122 is a no, no? You can, you can put the cut off somewhere at 118, but the idea is that that might look a little arbitrary. Okay. So, why is it that we never give rho eq a hard time over this fine tuning value compared to rho lambda? Actually, there are two relevant reasons. The first reason is that while rho lambda is a complete mystery and something nobody wanted and it just came upon us, rho eq is something which we believe we can compute. I will tell you in a minute how we plan to do that. We, we believe we have a framework and we might not have got it there, but we can compute that. And second, there is this folklore belief that lambda somehow has something to do with Planck length LP. Okay. So, though it was introduced purely classically in classical general relativity and things like that, I mean there is a sort of a belief that it must have. So, while lambda times Planck length square is a natural thing to look at and worry about, this is somewhat artificial and there is no reason this should be that. So, why do we think we have a way to compute rho eq? You just go back and uh, look at the definition of rho eq. It is essentially matter to radiation kind of ratio. And if you work it out and if you assume that the matter is essentially dominated by dark matter, so this will be the dominant term, but if you have dark matter and baryons, you take the mass of the dark matter candidate and you compute the number of dark matter to number of photons and then uh, mass of the baryon, the let us say the proton or nucleon times n b to n gamma, the photon to baryon ratio and rise to the power c. This is purely a numerical number in terms of uh, fundamental constant. So, we believe that once you know what the dark matter sector is and what is n b by n gamma and what is n dark matter by n gamma, then you can compute this in principle. Okay. So, it is not a mystery in the sense that we believe we have a high energy physics framework from which the dark matter particle should come, 
the baryogenesis should take place. So we should be able to compute all these numbers. And in principle, even though it is 10 to the minus 113, we will know why it is 10 to the minus 113. But in practice, we do not yet have a unique prediction because it depends on this and depends on this. So uh, I actually thought these are the topics which probably John would, uh, John Ellis would uh, include. So I haven't put in too much of it, but I will just rapidly go through this. So the first is the baryogenesis. How do we generate baryon? So the idea is to start with a theory which is originally symmetric with respect to baryon anti-baryon, and then you have a process, physical process by which excess of baryons are generated. Once again, here is a list. This is taken from a review some time back. I don't have a preference in any one of them. Other people have. But the idea is that there are so many models around, which can all, in some sense, produce the correct number. But there is nothing unique. The same issue goes for dark matter candidate. So depending on whom you are talking to, People would claim that almost all these things are uh, perfectly valid ideas for the dark matter candidate. And so we have a framework, true, and in fact we have more than one framework in which these numbers can probably be obtained and you can get the correct ballpark here, but we do not have a unique prediction for that. So here I can only echo what John Nellis said that theoreticians have to get their act together and to do more work and actually come up with a prediction. So then we will know rho eq. So up to this point, I was on fairly hard ground and uh, I was explaining to you the standard uh, picture and the standard non-cosmological constant and their relation to cosmological constant. In the last five minutes or so which I have, I'm going to go into a little bit of a speculation on a few other ideas related to, especially to this value of the A naught which I alluded to. So the first thing is about the cosmic geometry, which you are very familiar, is usually written in the friedman robertson walker coordinates. So suppose I am looking at a spatially flat uh, geometry of the universe. What is not often appreciated is that it is described by this metric. In this metric, I am using the density of the universe as a time coordinate. So as long as the density is sort of evolving monatomically, that is the time coordinate here. So what it tells you is the following. You just go out there and measure how much is the density and how much is the pressure. Okay? Or if you have an equation of state, you measure the density and then convert it into pressure. Then all the coefficients of the metric, so the g naught naught, so to speak, is just rho into rho plus p the whole square. There is uh, off diagonal term which is just rho plus p and then this is just r square d omega square. So this is very nice because this is some kind of an already solved form for the Einstein's equation. Usually in Einstein's equation, what is rho and p? Rho and p are essentially components of the stress energy tensor. You can never write down the metric, the metric tensor GAB entirely in terms of TAB in a normal geometry. Okay? But in Friedman model, because of the symmetries, you can just write down the metric entirely in terms of the instantaneous values of the density and the pressure. And this is the metric you will get when you do that. This has a few other nice features. Suppose you are looking at a constant time slice in the universe. So the constant time translates into constant density. So then this d rho square goes to zero. For those of you who are not general latest in the audience, I'm just spelling it out. You're at constant d rho and uh, this d rho also goes and you end up getting d r square plus r square times d omega square. So the constant time slices, the space is just Euclidean. It is Euclidean flat. It is not expanding. That is a very nice thing. We have all been grown up thinking that universe expands. So in this coordinate system, universe doesn't expand at a given time. It is just staying put there. If you want to reintroduce your conventional coordinate system, you take your rho and you have the equation of state which tells you what is p as a function of rho. And you do this integral. And you find this uh, integral gives you some um, relationship between, the, you define your time coordinate like this. Then this entire thing will become just dt square. So you can do that and then you can invert that and you can ask how this rho changes with this t. 
This T is also very nice because after you have written down this uh, metric, you can study its geometry and one of the favorite things which general relativists do when a geometry is given to you is to look for uh, geodesics of material particles. If you take the geodesics of the material particles and you put clocks to each of the geodesics, these clocks will measure some time and this time is exactly that time. So, it has a physical meaning attached to it. So, once you know the clock time of the geodesics, you can convert it back and write density in terms of this. So, if you go further, you can also define another function h of t by this relation. Once you have got this, you can define this. Uh, there, is, there is some, uh, this should be probably a product. I mean, there is something, something wrong in this. h of t is not equal to this number. Okay, sorry about that typo. So, once you have defined this h of t like this, you can rewrite the metric and this many of you would find familiar. This is what is known as the Panelli form of the friedman robertson walker universe. So, the metric here is again has the feature that if t is equal to dt is equal to 0 at constant time, this term goes away, this term goes away and it is just flat. The constant time surfaces are just normal Euclidean 3 space and then all the dynamics is introduced into this. This also tells you that the geometry only cares for one single function of time h of t. It does not care for a of t, it cares for h of t and you can rewrite this in this nice form. Okay. So, h r plus this quantity, where in order to go from here to here, you go and define a function a of t such that a dot upon a is a and this x is equal to r by a. Now, this I could have defined in very many different ways because there is a scaling freedom left here. So, it is the origin of this scaling freedom which allows you to rescale a. It has nothing to do with the fact that the coordinate system can be rescaled. This in turn introduces a new set of constants into cosmology which people do not usually talk about. These are what I would call the Godelian constants because these are constants, but you cannot determine them. You cannot write down their numerical value unlike rho eq or rho lambda or something. So, what are they? The simplest thing is a naught, but that is trivial. But you take the temperature of the CMBR at any epoch a and you multiply by a. This is a constant because the temperature of CMBR goes as 1 over a. So, this is a pure number, but you do not know what its pure number is until you tell me how you normalize a. If you have normalized a in such a way that a today is equal to 1, then this whole number is 2.73. If you normalize it such a way that my friend at redshift 8 was doing the measurements, then this to total number will be like 24 or something like that. Okay. So, there is a constant in the universe which you can determine only if this a naught is given, but the Friedman equations do not fix a naught. As a result of it, just from Friedman equations with no extra physical input, you will never be able to figure this out. And as I have already mentioned, it is not a trivial question of rescaling the coordinates because if you look at the metric in this form, this is, I like this form because at a t is equal to constant space, if I look surfaces of constant r, their areas are 4 pi r square. So, these are proper areas. So, as a result of which I can define this r coordinate in a purely geometrical form. And once I have done this, this is my metric. And I go from here to here by scaling things in order to get this a of t. So, the only natural normalization which you can have for a e q, which my friend at redshift of 8 as well as I can agree upon, is to set it such that when a when the radiation and matter has equality or any other two densities have equality, you set a eq to be 1 at that point and that is something which everybody will agree. Okay. So, this is the way one normally goes about. But suppose we do not do that, are there other physical principles by which I can fix a naught? As I said, if you are in pure Friedman geometry, a naught is not fixed, it is an arbitrary constant. It is a cosmic constant in the sense that there is a constant lurking around, but its value cannot be fixed from whatever we know so far. So, you want to have some interesting new physical principle. There are two interesting numbers which depend on a naught. So, I am going to conclude today's talk by just speculating on them. The first number, which is a rather interesting feature, 
is that the lifetime of the universe in what is known as a conformal time is finite if cosmological constant is not equal to 0. This is a bit strange because normally if you take a k is equal to 0 universe it expands forever and the time coordinate goes all the way to infinity. This is true for normal Friedman time and it is also true for what is known as the conformal time which is dt upon aft if there is no cosmological constant. But if you are in a universe with a cosmological constant then you can easily you can write this in this form and if the universe is expanding forever you can trivially see that if uh, for example it is matter dominated at very late stage and then the h scales as some a to the power uh, uh, 2 by 3 by 2 and that and this a square will essentially give you that it is a it is a divergent quantity. So, the eta will go without limit in a universe which has just matter and radiation for example, but no cosmological constant. It is nicer to write that same expression in this form where x is like 1 by a. So, this is the integral which you have to evaluate. This was used uh, in a different context with a for a k not equal to 0 model by Antony and uh, we used it for k is equal to 0 with a different purpose. So, what is interesting here is that this integral is finite because of this 1 which comes from cosmological constant. If it was not there it is it is going to have a divergent behavior and the time can go all the way to infinity, but this quantity is going to have a finite value the entire age of a universe which starts with radiation with a big bang singularity goes through an inflationary epoch then goes through a radiation and matter dominated epoch and then has a asymptotic cosmological constant dominated epoch. If you calculate the entire conformal time of that universe it is a finite number and that number if there is some physical principle to fix that value that depends on the value of a naught because if you scale a by some constant that value of this changes. So, you can have a principle which will fix that. There is another way of uh, determining that which is also interesting and I just wanted to mention that and conclude today. You can write down a dimensionless velocity of the universe which is essentially a dot and in order to eliminate the dimension of time you use the natural length scale h lambda coming from the cosmological constant. This velocity as we saw the universe is decelerating and then it is accelerating. So, that velocity hits a minimum. So, you can compute what that minimum value is. So, you get some value like this that sigma is essentially related to rho e q. If you have a principle which tells you what v minimum is that will fix your a e q a naught etcetera. So, for example, here is a picture you have d a by d t upon h lambda which is the velocity and this is your a and this is the way the universe was behaving the velocity of the universe was going. So, it sort of came to a point where the uh, cosmological constant started dominating and we are here today. So, this is the usual question which is posed in cosmological constant context as why now. So, why is it that this a naught is close to a lambda ok. So, there is this minimum. Now, suppose I rescale my a by some factor f say 10. Then you are going to shift this to the right and this is logarithmic. So, this separation remains the same and you also going to shift this v minimum to f times v minimum because that scales as a right. So, if I know what is this value of v minimum what is the minimum velocity the universe ever gets minimum dimensionless velocity that will tell me how to fix this scale. So, that scale is no longer arbitrary. Well, that is interesting and it is a speculative kind of a piece, but uh, you must be wondering why am I harping on this. The reason I am harping on this is it is a little bit intriguing that if I say that this velocity is 1 that is v by c is 1, it gives me a value of a naught which is consistent with 1 ok. So, this looks strange and I do not have an explanation for it, but it is a fact which you may want to keep in mind and that fixes all other scaling. In particular for example, the a times t of a which you compute is going to have a value which is very close to 2.73. This is just observational error. So, with a with 
the, which has been done with very liberal, many other people would say that the absolute errors are smaller, but is the kind of a maximum error you can think of in that. Which I find rather amusing that the fact that there is a lambda in the universe allows you to do this sort of thing, which you could not have done in the absence of lambda. And as I said, this is going to play a crucial role in tomorrow's talk, not this observation by itself, but the fact that if there is lambda and an inflationary phase and an in-between phase, then there has to be a coherent picture available in the universe, which is not present in the absence of that lambda. So this number comes essentially by giving a value for this. But let this be very clear as to what is new in this and what is standard. Now, we do know that this will have a minimum very close to the phase of dark matter domination. And we do know that that happened uh, just yesterday, so to speak. So as a result of which, we do expect this to occur at this epoch. However, the absolute value of V minimum is not fixed by this. It sort of fixes the horizontal scale, but not the vertical scale. And the vertical scale goes up or down depending on how you scale A. So if you take this V minimum to be 10, and this value will be 10. So as a result of it, there is an extra bit more than what you know in the context of why now problem of the cosmological constant, which comes up here, which I think is an interesting thing to keep in mind. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.